However, the present is conditional. Which all good presents are. Okay. This is some New Hampshire maple syrup. All right? And in order for you to accept this, you have to promise that every time maple syrup is brought up in conversation from now on, you have to make sure that you say New Hampshire has the only real maple syrup. So if you agree, happy birthday. I agree. Okay. You know, Mayor, New Hampshire is the only state that has real maple syrup. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. There we go. First of all, it's great to see everybody on this cold New Hampshire day. Tuesday is the day. We are three days away from voting. I am super excited. I know you're excited. I'm excited because it's been 11 months of campaigning here, doing town halls, answering every question, shaking every hand, being the last person to leave. I know you're excited because in three days, the commercials stop and the mail goes away and the text messages stop. You know, y'all have been great. We know in South Carolina, we're first in the um, South primary. And so we always love the fact that we got to see all the presidential candidates up close, but we always love to see them go. So I can appreciate that as well. How many of you are hearing me for the first time? Raise your hand. So most of you. Well, welcome. I'm glad that you're here. You know, I will tell you that what is important is we know that this is a tough time in our country. You don't have to turn on the news to see how tough it is. We're $34 trillion in debt. We're having to borrow money just to make our interest payments. China owns some of that debt. And I would love to tell you that Biden did that to us. But I have always spoken in hard truths, and I always will. Our Republicans did that to us, too. We saw that when they started that $2.2 trillion COVID stimulus bill that expanded welfare, that we now have 80 million Americans on Medicaid, 42 million Americans on food stamps. And you look at the wasteful spending that's coming out of Republicans and Democrats, and it's out of control. They've forgotten it's our money. It's not their money. They think they can keep printing it, and they can't. You know, you're going to see a lot of congressional people come and come in for Donald Trump. And he's racked up all of these congressional endorsements. And that's not what you will ever see me fight for. And the reason is they're going to rack them up for him because that's what he wants. But they're not going to come for me because what have I said? Congress has one job. Their only job is to give us a budget on time. Do you know they've only given us a budget four times in 40 years on time? And they don't like the fact that I say, if you don't give us a budget on time, you don't get paid, period. They don't like the fact that I think we need to have term limits in Washington, D.C., once and for all. They don't like the fact that I say we should have mental competency tests for anyone over the age of 75. And, you know, I'm not being disrespectful when I say that. We all know people who are over 75 that can run circles around us. And then we know Joe Biden, right? <laughs> Congress is now the most privileged nursing home in the country. So they don't like that I say that, but we're going to keep calling them out because at the end of the day, I'm fighting for you. And when you look at the fact that we have all of that spending and all of that debt, how are we going to get out of it? The best way to get out of it is to put an accountant in the White House. It's about time we do that, and I'm going to give that to you. So how will we fix the economy? The first thing we'll do is we'll claw back the over $100 billion of unspent COVID dollars that are still out there. Instead of 87,000 IRS agents going after middle America, we're going to go after the hundreds of billions of dollars of COVID fraud. One out of every $7 was spent fraudulently. If 8% of our budget is interest, quit borrowing. Cut up the credit cards. You have to balance a budget every day. I had to balance a budget as governor. Why is Congress the only group that refuses to balance a budget? 
We'll stop the spending. We'll stop the borrowing. We'll eliminate their pet projects and earmarks. And I'll veto any spending bill that doesn't take us back to pre-COVID levels. That will save us trillions. And then we're going to totally clean up D.C. We're going to take as many federal programs as we can and send them down to the state level. That will reduce the size of the federal government, but it will empower people on the ground. Right now, 70% of federal employees are still working from home three years after COVID. But while that's happening, also over 75% of most of our agencies are sitting empty. We're paying for that. Which one is it? Which one is it that we're going to do? We've got to start being smart with our spending. And so that's why when we take those federal programs and we send it down to the state level, think education, think welfare, think health care, think mental health, all of those things going down to the states with no strings attached. That's the way taxpayer dollars were meant to be spent, as close to the people as possible. And then we're watching the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. And we're going to open it up for the middle class. That's why I'm going to eliminate the federal gas and diesel tax in this country. We're going to cut taxes on the middle class and simplify the brackets. And we're going to make small business tax cuts permanent. They made corporate tax cuts permanent, but they made small business tax cuts temporary. You can look around this sweet town of Keene. Small businesses are the heartbeat of our economy. We have to start acting like it. And while we're at it, what a cool mayor you have, right? (laughs) He's walked me around your town. And I always say, you know, when somebody said the other day, they're like, oh, what do you think about the mayor? And I said, you know, I really like him because he's normal. (laughs) Like, don't we all want to see more normal people in office? He's normal. So that's how we'll start to deal with the economy, and we'll start to focus on paying down debt and getting it under control. But then we got to think about education. Right now in America, only 31% of eighth graders in our country are proficient in reading. Think about that. Only 27% of eighth graders are proficient in math. If we don't do something quick, we're going to be in a world of hurt 10 years from now. In South Carolina, we knew if a child couldn't read by third grade, they were four times less likely to graduate high school. So instead of pushing them forward, we started holding them back. We brought in their parents. We did reading remediation, and we set them up for success. We have to do that all over this country. We have got to get our kids reading again. And no parent should ever wonder what's being said or taught to their child in the classroom. We need complete transparency in the classroom. We will make sure every curriculum is online for parents to see. And parents have one job, and that's to make sure we do right by our kids. That's why every parent should be able to decide what mode of education and what school their children get educated in. Let's stop educating kids based on a on a zip code, and let's start educating them on what the parents think is best for them. And then let's start building things in America again. Let's put vocational classes back in our high schools. In South Carolina, we had apprenticeships all over our state. We taught our kids how to build the things that we were making. That way you get them invested in the economy even before they finish high school. And then I've got to tell you, it is important that we always remember to grow strong girls. Strong girls become strong women. Strong women become strong leaders. And let me tell you, none of that happens if you have biological boys playing in girls' sports. We've got to cut that out. And then when you look at what's happening on the border, It doesn't even look like the United States of America anymore. I can't believe that we would allow this to happen to our country. It's a complete dereliction of duty. As governor, I passed the toughest illegal immigration law in the country. President Obama sued me over it, and we won. 
We're going to take what I did in South Carolina, and we're going to go national with it. We're going to do a national E-Verify program so that every business has to prove that the people they hire are in this country legally. We are going to defund sanctuary cities once and for all. No more safe havens for illegal immigrants. We're going to make sure we put 25,000 Border Patrol and ICE agents on the ground and let them do their job. We'll go back to the Remain in Mexico policy so that no one even steps foot on U.S. soil. And instead of catch and release, we'll go to catch and deport. That is how we will close our border once and for all. And then my parents taught me you take care of those who take care of you. I'm going to ask you for taking care of those who take care of us. Right now in America, over 35,000 of our veterans are homeless. One in three suffers from PTSD or thoughts of suicide. We lose 22 heroes a day to suicide. If a veteran needs a doctor's appointment at the VA, on average, it takes 29 days. Why 29 days? Because on the 30th day, they get to go to the doctor or hospital of their choice. So midway through the 29 days, they get a call to reschedule, and the clock starts all over again. It's shameful how we treat our veterans. I'm the proud wife of a combat veteran. My husband deployed to Afghanistan. And when he came back home to us, that was a lot of prayers answered. But that was the easy part. When we got home, Life got hard. Michael couldn't hear loud noises. He couldn't be in crowds. Life had passed him by for the year that he was gone, and the transition was tough. We can't just love our men and women when they're gone. we got to love them when they come back home, too. That's why we'll make sure that we have telehealth so they get the mental health care they need right when they need it. They should be able to go to the doctor or hospital of their choice. They've earned that right. And I think the best way we deal with VA health care, I think every member of Congress should have to get their health care from the VA, and you watch how fast that gets fixed. <laughs> It'll be the best health care you've ever seen, guaranteed. And then there were two things when I was at the United Nations that Russia, China, and Iran never wanted us to have. They never wanted us to have a strong military, and they never wanted us to be energy independent. We won't be energy independent. We'll be energy dominant. We'll get the EPA out of the way. Right now they care more about sagebrush lizards than they do about whether we can afford our utility bill. We will speed up our permitting. We'll speed up the pipelines. We'll do the Keystone Pipeline. We'll export as much liquefied natural gas as we can. We'll do nuclear power. We won't do enough just to keep America going. Let's turn our energy industry into an economic powerhouse. That helps bring down inflation. That'll help bring down debt. That'll help grow our economy. That's what we need to do to go forward. No more going hat in hand to Saudi Arabia. No more getting dirty oil from Iran or Venezuela. And then let's talk about national security. The world is on fire, literally. You've got a war in Europe. You've got a war in the Middle East. You've got North Korea testing ballistic missiles that are capable of hitting the U.S. You've got China on the march. But make no mistake, none of that would have happened had we not had that debacle in Afghanistan. The idea that my husband and his military brothers and sisters who served there had to watch us leave Bagram Air Force Base in the middle of the night without telling our allies who stood shoulder to shoulder with us for decades because we asked them to be there. Think about what that told our friends. More importantly, think about what it told our enemies. And now America's just being reactionary. You're seeing multiple wars go up. Now you're seeing Iran and Pakistan. You're seeing multiple things happen. Why? Because they smell blood in the water. And they know America's weak. Look at our number one national security threat, China. China's been planning war with us for years, and I'm not exaggerating. I dealt with China every single day that I was at the United Nations. And they're already here. They've bought over 400,000 acres of U.S. soil. 
most recently near Grand Forks Air Force Base, where our most sensitive drone technology is. They put millions of dollars into our university, stealing our research, spreading Chinese propaganda. You go and you look at the fact we were all upset by the Chinese spy balloon, right? Rightfully so. Well, China said it was a weather balloon. If China's talking, they're lying. We know that. But we actually now know it went and it touched a U.S. Internet company, got all the surveillance it needed, and sent it to China. What about the fact that 90% of our law enforcement drones are Chinese. Think about the many surveillance that's happening. There are Chinese police stations throughout our country. They're putting a Chinese spy base off our shores in Cuba. They've killed more Americans with fentanyl than the Iraq, Afghanistan, and Vietnam wars combined. 75,000 Americans last year alone. And China's building up their military at a scary pace. They have 500 nuclear warheads. That's 400. That's 100 more than they had last year. They have the largest naval fleet in the world. They have 370 ships. They'll have 400 ships in two years. We won't even have 350 ships in two decades. They're doing artificial intelligence. They're doing cyber. They're doing space. They're doing hypersonic missiles. We've barely gotten started. And now China's the lead developer on neurostrike weapons. Weapons engineered to change the brain activity of military commanders and segments of the population. That's who we're dealing with. So don't let Biden tell you that China is a competitor. I worked with them every day. China never saw us as a competitor. They always saw us as an enemy. We've got to look at them the way they look at us. And how do we deal with them? The first thing we do is we stop the sale of any U.S. land and we start taking back the land they already purchased. We go to our universities and we say, you take foreign money or you take American money. But the days of taking both are over and we get that infiltration out of our universities. We blacklist all technology that builds up the Chinese military and hurts America. The Biden administration approved 70% of that technology last year. The Trump administration approved even more than that. we got to cut that out. You don't do things that threaten America. And then we're going to make sure we go to China and we're going to say we're going to end all normal trade relations with you until you stop murdering Americans with fentanyl. You watch how fast they switch because they need our economy. And then we build up our military. Strong militaries don't start wars. Strong militaries prevent wars. And you don't do that by throwing a bunch of money at the Department of Defense. We actually need to clean it up. You take down the red tape. You take down the bureaucracy. You get rid of all these programs they have no business being involved in. I mean, for goodness sake, stop the gender pronoun classes. It's demoralizing our military. And then let's focus on what it takes to to take on those threats going forward. We've got generals now focused on past wars, land, air, sea. We need to be focused on threats of the future, cyber, artificial intelligence, space, hypersonic missiles, submarines. That's what we need going into the future. When we focus on those things, when we take our head out of the sand, that's when our enemies will be on their heels. But you look at what's happened now. Donald Trump has got to stop praising these dictators. It's not good for us. You look, he praised President Xi a dozen times after China gave us COVID. He told China he was standing with them when they took Hong Kong. He celebrated and congratulated them on their 70th anniversary of being communists. Who does that? That's where America. He talks to Kim Jong-un and says he loves their love letters. It's scary. And then you go and you look. I had to sit down and have a conversation with him because he was having too much of a bromance with Putin. <laughs> like you can't. These, these are enemies that want to hurt us. It's not a game. So we know what we need to do on our domestic side. We know what we need to do on our national security side. But what we have to also do is acknowledge some hard truths. I voted for Donald Trump twice. I think he was the right president at the right time. I agree with a lot of his policies. 
But rightly or wrongly, chaos follows him. Y'all know I'm right. Chaos follows him. And we can't be a country in disarray and have a world on fire and go through four more years of chaos. We will not survive it. And something that should send a chill up your spine? A President Kamala Harris. And this isn't a joke. You look at what's happening in the general election polls. Look at any of them. In any of them, Trump and Biden are in a dead heat. On a good day, Trump might be up by two points. That's margin of error. It's a nail-biter of an election, and that's a, a breath away from a President Kamala Harris. You look at me in every one of those same polls, I defeat Biden by 17 points. Do you know what that means? That's bigger than the presidency. That's House, that's Senate, that's governorships, that's all the way down to the school board. You win by double digits, that's a mandate going into D.C. to stop the wasteful spending and get our economy back on track. That's a mandate saying we're going to get our kids reading again and go back to the basics in education. That's a mandate to secure our borders with no more excuses. That's a mandate to bring law and order back to our country. And that's a mandate for a strong America that we can all be proud of. Don't you want that again? Trump was upset by the poll I just mentioned to you, where I was up by 17 points. It was a Wall Street Journal poll. And he's like, that's a dirty poll. It was done by his own pollster. (laughs) It's reality. And we have to face reality. And you look, and I've seen the commercials you've seen. And let me tell you, everything Donald Trump's put up there is a lie. And if you have to lie to win... You don't deserve to win. He says, I raised the gas tax in South Carolina. I never raised the gas tax in South Carolina. But you know what he did? He proposed all of us having to pay a 25-cent gas tax hike when he was president in 2018. I paid down debt. And while people talk about what a good economy it was under Trump, it was good, right? But at what cost? He put us $8 trillion in debt in four years. We're never going to pull out of that. It's going to take us a long time. You don't run up the credit card to have a good economy. That's no different than Biden going and depleting our oil reserves to lower gas prices. You don't do that. That's not the way you get a good economy. We really do have a choice to make. He says, I want to cut Social Security. I've never once said I'm going to cut Social Security. He doesn't want me to cut Social Security. (laughs) (laughs) What I've said is we have to acknowledge the fact that Social Security goes bankrupt in 10 years. Medicare goes bankrupt in eight. So the changes we make are to those in our kids in their 20s, not for anybody that's paid in. That's how we make sure you get it. So everything he's done, he's been telling lies. And we have to start saying, is that what we want? Politics for me is not personal. It's never been personal. Donald Trump, it's not personal. It's not that I don't like him. I have no problem with him being who he is. I dealt with him every day. It was always something. <laughs> but thats it's not personal with me. I'm doing this because I don't want my kids to continue to live like this. We can do better. But what does that mean? It means that on Tuesday, every one of you is making a decision. It's a decision to either go with more of the same or to move forward. More of the same is 70% of Americans have said they don't want Trump or Biden. The majority of Americans have said they disapprove of Trump and Biden. Look at their approval numbers. They are in the tank. You look at the fact that both of these men put us trillions of dollars in debt. None of them watched out for our taxpayer dollars. 
And do we really want to go into an election with two fellas that are going to be president in their 80s? And that's not ageism that I'm saying here. We see that Biden has changed so much over two years. But last night, Trump is at a rally. And he's going on and on mentioning me multiple times as to why I didn't take security during the Capitol riots. Why I didn't handle January 6th better. I wasn't even in D.C. on January 6th. I wasn't in office then. They're saying he got confused that he was talking about something else. He was talking about Nancy Pelosi. He mentioned me multiple times in that scenario. The concern I have is I'm not saying anything derogatory, but when you're dealing with the pressures of a presidency, we can't have someone else that we question whether they're mentally fit to do this. We can't. So that's the choice you have. Do you want to win in November or not? Do you want to be scared in November or not? Do you want your kids to be proud in November or not? Then let's do it. Let's do it because we have the opportunity to do this. We can make a difference. And in order to do that, it's going to take a lot of courage. Courage from every single person in this room. Courage from me to Ryan. Encourage for every one of you to know, don't complain about what happens in a general election if you don't play in this primary, because it matters. Someone asked me why I was running. And I said, you know, my parents came here 50 years ago to an America that was strong and proud and full of opportunities. I want them to know that country again. I'm doing this for my husband, Michael, and his military brothers and sisters. They need to know their sacrifice matters. They need to know that we love our country. I'm doing this for my daughter who just got married, and I saw how hard it was for her and her husband to buy a home. The average home buyer in America now is 49 years old. The American dream is leaving them. I'm doing this for my son who's a senior in college, and I'm tired of watching him write papers of things he doesn't believe in just to get an A. That's not us. That's not America. And for the first time, 81% of Americans don't think their kids are going to live as good of a life as we did. We can't be okay with that. I'm not okay with that. We do have a country to save. You know, six months ago, I dropped my husband Michael off at 4 a.m. for another year-long deployment. And I watched him and 230 soldiers pick up their two duffel bags of belongings to go to a country they'd never been, all in the name of protecting America. They're willing to sacrifice their lives and their families because they still believe in this amazing experiment that is America. So if they're willing to sacrifice for us there, shouldn't we be willing to fight for America here? Because we have a country to save. And you get to fight for America on Tuesday. So go out and get 10 people and take them to the polls. If you go to the polls and you take 10 people, we're going to have a good day. But you will also be doing, bless you, your patriotic duty. You will also be making sure that you are showing your voice and you're part of the solutions. And what I will do is I will spend my entire time trying to make you proud and fighting for you every day. So you do this on Tuesday. And I promise you, our best days are yet to come. God bless you, Keen. Thank you so much.